A Red Book arrives on doorsteps unannounced, igniting fury in the community. Shell Canada, an international energy giant, reveals plans to drill a potentially dangerous sour gas well close to Rocky Mountain House, Alberta. This town of 5,500 people is built upon both the agriculture and oil and gas industries. Shell's move creates a conflict that affects everyone. The effect it'll have on the air, the water, uh, their livelihoods, the value of their property and so on. The, we think those are legitimate for ordinary people to be concerned about. They should abandon the, the whole uh, proposal completely. Don't invade us and start poisoning us and our animals and everything around us. It's a clash between the right to live undisturbed on personal property without an imposed risk to health and safety and the right to pursue economic profit. The conflict in Alberta between landowners and the oil and gas industry has escalated into violence. Nighttime bombings, death threats, fatal shootings, jail terms. What is the fear that can drive normally peaceful citizens to extremes? years and uh, when we first came here it was a total bush my husband had to hack away with the axe from the road to make a roadway into where our house was going to be built Barney is the third generation of Bertinoli to farm in this area he returned to help his mother Marcella four years ago after his father passed away well this is the area where we summer pasture our cattle here. It's directly beside the proposed well areas. We have a proposal going about 50 meters from this fence here. Directly east is our new home. And just over on the other side of that road, approximately another 50 or 60 meters, there's a, a draw. And it's like an underground stream that leads into the Clearwater River. The Tates live across the river from the Bertinolis. They've been in this area for 20 years. Wanda is a public health nurse. Eric is a school teacher. Well, first of all, a person should realize that this, the well site is pretty well across the river from here. If you go up and through the field, it's on the other side of this gorge. If, for example, they're planning a second well in this area that we just walked through, then obviously there's going to have to be a pipeline between there and here. Uh, but we don't know that because Shell won't tell us. The people who live near the proposed well site fear the deadly poisonous hydrogen sulfide, also known as H2S, that there could be an accident during drilling, or a pipeline break beneath the river, or an unexpected release of hydrogen sulfide at the wellhead during the years of operation. We, we know that a thousand parts per million is instantly fatal. Uh, six or seven hundred parts per million is fatal within a, a, a couple of breaths. The Ferrier Well outside of Rocky Mountain House is estimated to be 34% H2S, or 340,000 parts per million. When the serious opposition to the well becomes clear, Shell brings in George Gerlach as project manager. Each month that drilling is delayed affects the bottom line. With record-breaking gas prices, an active well could be grossing millions of dollars a year in revenue. George is accountable for getting the Ferrier well back on track. Veterinarian Martha Kostuk is a well-known environmentalist who works with landowners, government, and industry. When Dr. Kostuk first moved to Rocky Mountain House in the mid-70s, there were 70 oil and gas companies operating in the province. 
now, there are over 1,200. At the same time, the complexion of the rural community evolved as urbanites migrated to the country. So we have an increase in conflict between the oil and gas industry, the increase in activity, the increased number of companies, and the increase in residents in, in the areas surrounding this activity. Uh, we're finding significantly more interaction with landowners and various groups in those, uh, in those areas. And that has resulted in, uh, and I wouldn't call it necessarily conflict, but, uh, but significantly more heated debate. I maybe don't have too many years left. I would like to breathe nice fresh air like we've always had, when I think that it might not be that way. It makes us feel bad. As sweet gas pools are depleted and energy demands increase, industry drills deeper in search of sour gas with lethal levels of H2S. Our, our perspective is sour gas is, is a dangerous substance. We have the attitude that we work with this all the time. We recognize that the landowners that are near to the sites that we drill on do uh, worry about it. Well, the gas would come right down here. It would come down here, yes. So if there were people here canoeing or if we're here walking, that's it? <laughs> we're sunk? Well, I guess uh, the short answer to that might be yes. Shell has, has had over 50 years of, of safe uh, drilling and operating uh, of sour gas wells. And uh, uh, we feel that, uh, that there won't be any issue at all with any kind of exposure. But there have been accidents. Shells and others in the sour gas corridor which hugs the Rocky Mountain foothills. Pipeline leaks and blowouts are part of the local consciousness. Individual landowners felt powerless to confront Shell, so they formed the Clearwater Coalition. The coalition took its concerns to the Energy and Utilities Board, the quasi-judicial body that has regulated the Alberta energy industry since 1915. Eric and the others expected to proceed to a hearing, but rather than starting with a formal hearing, the parties try to find a mutually acceptable solution. Despite extreme opposition among landowners and at the cost to Shell of again delaying production, the parties agree to come to the mediation table. Landowners hope they can make Shell understand their concerns. If they find common ground in mediation, the formal hearing will be more straightforward and perhaps avoided entirely. A core group of coalition members form a steering committee representing the 50 families who oppose the well. Eric Tate is the coalition chair. The starting point for residents is that nothing that happens is going to provide us with a level of safety that we already have. What we've discussed thus far is uh, an attempt to allay certain of those concerns that we have and bring them down to a reasonable level. I mean, the, the reason why we're here is that uh, the government allows us to, to explore. We have subsurface rights, and yes, there are landowners with surface rights, and, and we're basically, when the government sells us the land or sells somebody else the land that we farm into, we take that, that opportunity. And yes, we do try to make money when oh, we find yeah. something. And, and, That's and we, we respect you guys for, for, for coming to the table and, and talking about these issues because what is happening in the wider communities, people like ourselves are getting very angry with, with these smaller companies that come in and just go in and do these things. And there's no discussion. And we're left high and dry regardless of what happens. At least Shell has had the, uh, uh, the integrity to come to the table and discuss this thing. It seems that if a well is drilled, it's not going to simply sit there in a field. It's going to be tied into a system. Absolutely. And without considering the implications of, of how it's tied in on the production facilities, it makes it rather a hollow exercise just to go through, just to go through the well. So we want to take the consideration of, of looking at the whole picture that you are going to come in once your foot is in the door. This well could literally be one well and we walk and we're out of the community. 
it could be a situation where it's the first of four, five, or six wells, but but we still don't know until we actually drill the well what we have at the end of the day. One of the most sensitive areas to be addressed is the emergency response plan, which will go into effect in the case of an accident. And a level one means we have had a significant kick or lost circulation. Shell experts insist that there is little risk. In the unlikely event of a blowout, they believe it will take at least six hours for sour gas to reach the surface. They want the recommended 19 kilometer emergency response zone reduced to four kilometers, which means they won't be responsible for notifying or evacuating a larger area, which would include the town of Rocky Mountain House. We get a, an emergency situation that, that uh, necessitates the evacuation of people. I think it also has to acknowledge that livestock in the area, which, uh, from which a lot of us make a living, is also going to be threatened. If there is a blowout or if there is a leak, then we don't want to have to be left out in the cold? Absolutely. So hypothetically, let's say there's a blowout, you have a herd downwind and they die, right? And we have monitoring equipment and it shows that they're at, at 50 or 100 ppm or whatever. I don't think there's any issue as to how we'd handle that. I mean, we're to blame for that. But if we're responsible, we pay for it. I do not take the view that if somebody else is responsible, I pay for it because I'm part of the industry. I don't think that uh, I would trust anybody to be able to say the wind uh, specifically blew this way or that way on any given day. I mean, you can get a, a squall or a swirl or whatever and, uh, you know, uh, these things can change. I have absolutely no problem with the petroleum industry. I have a whole lot of problem with the way they do things. And the, and the problem that I have with the way they do things is that they are backed up by the provincial government who, it would appear to the rest of the population of the province, allows them to do things as they wish. Then it puts your average citizen in a terrible pickle. So the only thing you can do is get into a group like this or move away. That's, there's, there's nothing else left. In this, uh, in this particular case, uh, Shell does have, um, have permission uh, from the subsurface owner to, uh, uh, to drill the well. And um, we've actually got permission from, uh, from the surface owner as well. So we have two, essentially, two key components that we normally need uh, to drill a well. And that is to have the subsurface and the surface owner's permission. Uh, to go ahead and do it. The one issue that's cropped up in this particular case is the fact that we don't have the community support and that is that is key in, uh, in doing this. The oil companies and the gas companies come in uh, to a piece of land with the intention of exploiting a resource. And once that uh, resource is exploited, they move on. Uh, just like the nomads in prehistoric days. When the Manuels emigrated from Africa, they came to Canada because they believed an advanced legal and political system would offer them protection as landowners. Felicity and I uh, both were born and raised in Kenya, in East Africa, and we left in 1975. And what happened in Kenya after independence is that um, the indigenous people wanted access to land. And I have no argument with that, but what happened then was that basically we were forced out. Their experience with the Alberta oil and gas industry has made them skeptical. I have heard explosions in the night that you would have thought you were in the war zone. And I know it's from them drilling the wells and the flaring. And these things go off at 2.30 in the morning when People are asleep and nobody really knows they're going on. And the only reason I knew was because I was checking the cows when during calving. Eighty-three percent of the prosperous Canadian oil and gas industry is located in Alberta. Alberta's history, culture and identity are closely tied to oil and gas. Except in a few instances, the provincial government controls mineral rights to the rich resources which lie beneath the soil. 
These rights are held separately from surface rights and allow the government to take payment in the form of license fees and royalties. A province of only three million residents, recent revenues from that industry have reached $8.5 billion per year and continue to increase with the steepest rise in world gas prices in history. The golden child of Alberta, the oil and gas industry, has traditionally enjoyed public approval and unfettered government support. So why, at a moment of historic prosperity, are landowners at odds with the industry? We have had lots of dealings with oil companies and they're good dealings. We've been very happy with them and we have two oil wells on some of our land and it has caused no pollution, no trouble of any kind. That is the oil. But as soon as they want to start with sour gas wells, there's such a potential for so much trouble. Well, it was November the 3rd, 98, when we got this place. Exactly one month later, we received this in the mail. A Shell public information package, which contained a emergency evacuation notice and a proposal to drill a sour gas well directly across from us, right upwind from us and right next door to us. So we had about one whole month to enjoy the open spaces in our scenic new home before we were shocked into this. As soon as this was received, the community uh, reaction was instantaneous. There was a public meeting held within 36 hours of the receipt of this information. Approximately 50 people attended that public meeting, and um, they were absolutely adamant that uh, they would do everything they could to oppose the well. It did cause us to relook at, at things when we did understand just how how upset the people were in the area and how opposed they were to the operation. So then, of course, we, we, uh, we contacted the Energy Utilities Board and began the whole process of um, applying for public hearing in order to try and block uh, Shell's drilling license. By late June, both Shell and the landowners know that a hearing won't be avoided. So I'm supposed to collect a bunch of data regarding uh, wind direction and the effects of hydrogen sulfide on herd health and respiratory systems and all that. And I feel uh, a lot of it won't even matter because we'll be dead. If we're poisoned, the respiratory problems of the herd don't matter. It's my own respiratory problems will supersede that. The problem is, is if they get their way and they put this well through, then we start losing animals. How do we prove it's because of something that we can't see, which is poison gas in the air? And you know that emergency response plan that they've devised, it's completely useless for us because we don't have any exits away from the well. All our exits are in the direction of the well. So it doesn't even matter. They, they wouldn't have time to phone us or nothing if there was ever a leak. Apparently the worst stuff is the stuff you can't smell. So we can go outside for a breath of fresh air one day and literally kill ourselves. Yeah, that's yeah. us. Yeah. Most of the landowners have full-time jobs as farmers, ranchers, teachers. The work of battling industry is crammed into the hours at the end of a busy workday, on weekends. By the time this comes to hearing in October, it will be two years since Shell's little red book arrived on our doorstep. And um, it's been a very hard, long, demanding two years for all of us. It's a long road, but they have a lot at stake. In 1982, one of the worst sour gas drilling accidents in world history occurred a mere one hour from Rocky Mountain House, near the hamlet of Lodgepole, Alberta. 
uncontrolled venting of sour gas was ignited after 26 days. It burned for six weeks. Two workers were killed. Silverware turned black 100 kilometers away. Emissions were detected 1,500 kilometers away in Winnipeg. And people woke up to the danger of sour gas. Drilling practices were revolutionized so that a similar accident would never happen again. And the further effects of sour gas received attention for the very first time. Things like, um, like drilling mud disposal and, and the way we operate uh, sour gas wells was a result of the, of the lodge pole blowout in 82. And they're being incorporated in every sour gas well that's drilled by ourselves or by industry now in the province. Since Lodgepole, there hasn't been a single sour gas blowout in Alberta. But other concerns persist. We have farmers that are being affected by water contamination, groundwater or surface water. We have just many, many different incidences all over the province, and nobody that they could turn to in the government for any kind of help. It was expected that the industry would solve those problems on their own, and they didn't. So at the same time that energy industry was exploding in Alberta, the regulators were being decreased significantly, both the number of people and the money that they had to do the job. So uh, they turned regulation over to the companies. In 1994, farmers near Caroline, Alberta, 40 minutes from Rocky Mountain House, saw something unusual discoloring the ice of the Red Deer River. It was a sour gas pipeline leak. And they said, you know, the chances of a pipeline leak happening were less than getting struck by lightning and, and so forth. Well, six months after the pipeline was commissioned, there was a pipeline leak, a major pipeline leak uh, that uh, leaked a lot of gas and condensates into the river and gas into the air and affected a number of herds of cattle. Um, one of those herds, or two of those herds, were quite seriously affected, lost a number of animals, uh, and the health of those herds has still not recovered. In the case of, of the Caroline uh, leak, uh, the pipeline had not been in operation very long. Uh, we were also in a, in a situation where uh, some of the fluids had actually been sitting there. We hadn't produced uh, in the pipeline. And, um, and as a result, uh, we believe that that actually uh, contributed to the, to the problem that we had that caused the leak. It was a, a very extreme situation and one that we've learned from uh, since that time. We have a lot of pipeline breaks, so we, but we have a lot of pipelines in this province. And they're getting older and, and they're breaking. 277,000 kilometers of oil and gas pipelines snake beneath the surface of Alberta. There are 33,000 producing oil wells and 47,000 producing gas wells, of which 5,000 are defined as sour gas. Production continues at an unprecedented rate. The Energy and Utilities Board receives 25,000 oil and gas applications per year for wells, pipelines, and other facilities. Only a few go to hearing at the urging of the public. And a small fraction of these, two to four, are turned down. The EUB views this as effective management of its mandate to ensure that Alberta's resources are developed in the public interest. But landowners fear that the prevailing definition of public interest puts the public purse ahead of health and safety. We believe that the public expects us to ensure that uh, as for any new application, that both public safety and the environment are protected. We also believe that the public expects that um, as resources are developed, and these are resources that they own, as this occurs, that the resources are conserved and the benefits to Albertans are maximized. Public concern continues to mount. The Clearwater Coalition receives calls from other landowners in sour gas areas asking for advice. The EUB launches a task force to investigate. The Sour Gas Review Committee hears that Albertans are afraid. Their number one concern is health. Well, many people are, are sensitive to sulfites in foods. Uh, sulfites are frequently used as preservatives 
in, in a number of foods, including such things as wines and beers, but also in a number of other foods like dried fruits. Well, sulfites, people who are sensitive to sulfites are usually also sensitive to sour gas or hydrogen sulfide because it's basically the same compound. There hasn't been much research done on the effects of H2S or sour gas pollution on human health. Uh, industry's answer is, well, you have no proof. Um, and you, basically, it's, it's anecdotal evidence. It's just uh, they suggest that it's being made up or it's all in people's heads. But it's not. It's very real. Residents of Rocky Mountain House work in both agriculture and the oil and gas industry. The Farrier Well debate impacts the entire community. It would be very easy for some parties to say, well, it's uh, individual uh, acreage owners that have brought this thing to their head. Not at all. Uh, the whole community, whether it's uh, livestock operators, farmers, uh, doesn't matter what they do, has come together and everybody uh, has had input to try and understand this thing and make it such that the community can at least live with what happens. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Hopefully this will be the last meeting that we'll have prior to the public hearing. In early August, the steering committee holds a meeting to bring their neighbors up to date and to introduce them to lawyer Richard Secord, who has taken over their case. He brings extensive experience and a new strategy for fighting their battle with Shell. I think most of you are aware that we, that's to say the coalition, ended into mediation with Shell as uh, reluctant brides. It became very quickly apparent that one thing that was not going to happen was that Shell was going to, going to walk away. But I think they went into it with the idea that if we explain this carefully and in great detail, these people, we'll convince them that it's all okay and they'll, they'll, they'll go away. I mean, the, the government of Alberta grants the oil companies the lease. Part of the deal is if you don't drill during the lease period, you lose the lease. So it's set up that the oil company has to drill. The, the government, of course, then says, here's the Energy and Utilities Board, you the landowner, duke it out with the oil company over the drilling process. Money is the bottom line. They're in it for money, and they didn't say they didn't care how they got it, but you're certainly left with that impression. I find that uh, very surprising. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I really do want to be fair to the people who, uh, to the Shell representatives who have been at the table. I think they're trying to, to bridge an impossible gap. I wonder how many letters we have to write. I've sent already at least 12 letters. Oh, that, that, uh, that's good. I mean, if you want to read your letter to the board, you can do that. Um, or if you want to just speak as to how you feel about the application and what your concerns are, you can do that. So it doesn't matter if it is one of the 40 families, as long as they're within a reasonable distance or exactly how do you determine whose information you can accept? Well, for instance, you know, does a school bus go through the emergency response zone? It obviously does. Do these families who live outside of this four kilometer circle have kids in that bus? They do. And so they have every right to express their views and have them put forward to the board. Although coalition members are fully aware that the EUB approves the vast majority of industry applications, Secord has bolstered their confidence. As the November hearing date approaches, there is an end in sight. Eric Tate and the coalition have taken their concerns to the public health officer for the region. Currently what's happening is that we're getting public health complaints from concerned citizens or coalitions, in this case the Clearwater Coalition, 
and we have to react to that under the Public Health Act. Disturbed that a critical sour gas well could be approved without even notifying the health region, Rudy Zimmer has taken unprecedented steps. The original application had approximately two pages in it, and when we went to the industry and worked with them, we got back what would be an appropriate formal human health assessment. A month prior to the hearing, an accident brings the threat home. An explosion at a nearby well burns for two days. It's a sweet gas well, so hydrogen sulfide isn't a factor, but it's a dark reminder of the nature of gas production. After two years of uncertainty, the hearing finally begins, which will determine the fate of the Farrier Well proposal. The Energy and Utilities Board will be represented by a three-member panel, ultimately charged with making the decision of whether or not the proposed well can be drilled. For the next two weeks, they'll meet in this local country hall to give Shell and those who oppose the well a forum for their arguments. What we'll do today is first ask the applicant, Shell Canada, to come forward and present its evidence. Witnesses for the applicant will then be available from questions from the various interveners in the order that we've registered you today. The board staff will then have an opportunity to ask questions, and that will be followed by questions from the panel itself. And again, I just urge you, uh, if questions do arise at, at any of the breaks, uh, approach the board staff. I, I'm, I know they can, they can help you in, in anything that you need, need some direction in. Let me just start with what I believe is an important context to put this into. There's an increasing demand for energy in the world and in the province and in the country, and particularly natural gas. It's an increasing demand for natural gas to heat our homes, to run our power plants, to run our businesses, to fuel our economy. Uh, there's a need for this gas, and there's a need for Shell to test their property rights. There's only one way to do that. There's only one way for Pan-Canadian and Shell to get the benefit of their property rights, and that's to test this well, to first find out if there are economically recoverable hydrocarbons there. Mr. Chairman, board members, my name is Ian Kilgour, and I'm the general manager of Foothills Operations for Shell Canada and I am ultimately responsible for the proposed Ferrier 7 of 7 exploration well under discussion at today's hearing. I'd like to begin by discussing our relations with local landowners and the impact of this proposed well on residents. We offended many people with the timing of our information package in late 1998, and although this was completely unintentional, it started their en entire relationship with the community off on the wrong foot. We apologize for that and we would like to stress that we immediately took full responsibility for our mistake. We have engaged in almost two years of community consultation and six months of mediation in an effort to understand the community's concerns. Our ongoing commitment is to continue to develop natural gas resources in an environmentally, socially and economically responsible manner consistent with our corporate policy on sustainable development. Mr. Chairman, I will now turn Shell's opening statement over to Mr. George Gerlach, who will continue with more specific aspects of the project that he has directly managed over the past 18 months. Like many Alberta Deep Plains or Foothills gas wells, Shell's proposed Farrier 7 of 7 well may contain high concentrations of sour gas or hydrogen sulfide. We remain confident that for technical, economic, safety, and environmental reasons, 7 of 7 is the best location to target the Swan Hills, Ostracod and Ellerslie formations while addressing the public's health, safety, and environmental concerns. We fully realize our responsibility to protect public safety when we drill and operate sour gas wells and can demonstrate that our emergency response plan will protect the safety of all residents. I have uh, questions in five principal areas. The first area we'll be dealing with hazard and risk. We defined the worst case release and asked uh, Jake Whitford to, to model that worst case situation. So I understand then you asked Jake Whitford to provide a description of the worst imaginable release? I don't know if we used those words, but we uh, certainly wanted to look at a worst case release situation. Well, the, the fact of the matter, sir, is that my clients happen to live in close proximity to this proposed sour gas well. And uh, the question that I want answered is which worst case risk are you asking the board to consider? 
Are we dealing with a zero ignition time, or are we dealing with a worst-case scenario of a six-minute delay in ignition? Our emergency response plan, when activated, will ensure that all residents in the emergency planning zone are evacuated. Give me a scenario, Mr. Kilgore, that puts some time frame uh, around it. In terms of Shell's experience with uh, blowouts, for instance. Well, fortunately, we have very little experience with blowouts, so I can't call on our experience, only the experience in uh, normal operating conditions. On day one, Shell and its contracted experts have stated their case. The coalition members are fired up to present their side, but it could be days before they have the opportunity. The model is not conservative, it understates the risk, therefore the emergency response zone that they've settled on four kilometers is completely inadequate. Dispersion has become the core scientific discussion. If there is a blowout, H2S will leave the well. The scientists debate how much and how far it will travel. Their calculations are based on uncertain H2S levels at estimated release rates with unknown wind direction, wind speed and vapor levels. Ian Dowsett, the expert working on behalf of the coalition, believes that if a blowout occurs and is not ignited immediately, harmful levels of H2S could reach the surrounding homes within 15 minutes. On the other hand, Shell repeats that there is little risk and that if there is a blowout, the men on the rig will ignite the gas within two minutes, which will convert the H2S to less harmful emissions. In our view, it, both of these models and other dispersion models have a very valid uh, role to play. The real question is the selection of an appropriate model that is appropriate to the gas being dispersed. So you're going to be, what, about half an hour or so, or 20 minutes? Uh, Maybe more, depending on how long it takes them to answer the question. Ultimately, you've got a situation where you have a well that has a problem. They've got to make a decision whether or not they're going to basically blow up, the, the, they're going to sacrifice the rig. Last on the roster, the affected community finally has their opportunity to speak. All of us who've been active in this issue have come to realize one ghastly truth. The science behind all of this is horribly inexact. The day I wrote my submission to Mr. Secord, October 1st, 2000, black smoke billowed up in the sky behind our house. My mother-in-law and I were picking potatoes and she said, somebody is burning something out there. And I said, that is a blowout. What had indeed happened was the service rig that three men were working on had somehow released gas, set the rig on fire, blew one man out of the tower and critically burned two on the ground. The flames were higher than any, from any fire that I had ever seen. It was totally not under control for two days. Now this was a sweet gas well. What if that had been a critical level four sour gas well? Many of the interveners, uh, the professionals, believe the plan is flawed. Well, I don't know which one's right. I'm not smart enough to understand that. But there is definitely, I'm smart enough to understand there is doubt. My home and my son Barney's place are directly downwind from the proposed sour gas well. The northwest winds always sail right over my home, and on foggy days, it settles right above. I've been in the oil business for, for 30 years. Uh, when I was starting out in the business, I was drilling, and uh, I witnessed uh, a co-worker go down to sour gas, and it was extremely frightening. First of all, the risk I take, and I acknowledge that I do take a risk when I drive out down the road in my car, I have controls over that risk. And I can weigh the benefit against the risk and decide whether I'm willing to take the risk or not. That is not the case in the drilling of this well. And I have absolutely nothing to gain and everything to lose if the risk is taken and it goes bad. Shell uses their experts, so-called experts, Theories, charts, graphs, curves, angles, math, consultants, and computers to create an illusion or a perspective that what the people are saying is not the truth when in fact it is. 
and I feed my cattle from the cleanest food and water sources I can. I have fresh water as a primary resource that my operation must have. The chance that it even slightly impairs the clean taste of my organic beef is one that I cannot take. And I, for one, when I hear this, feel as though I've been transported back to the 60s and I'm sitting in a room talking to a group of tobacco manufacturers. A Shell representative made a statement, uh, impossible, that can't happen. Gentlemen, it can happen. In 1912, a ship left Liverpool was not supposed to sink. Things happen. 1986, a spacecraft took off. Challenger. A simple O-ring took it out of the sky at 59,000 feet. There's a Russian nuclear submarine laying at the bottom of the Bering Sea right now. Things do happen. Let me be blunt and tell you that if this project goes ahead, the fact that you have quasi-judicial status will mean absolutely nothing to us. If any of our children die or get incurably sick, to use the technical jargon from either an acute or chronic situation, then you stand to be cursed at the dying of the sun and the rising of the moon. Why? Because you are the only people in a position to say no. You will be haunted at every turn of the season because it is you who we shall hold responsible, not Shell. You've heard the passion, the frustration expressed by my neighbors. How can you ignore it? We don't want this well drilled. And if you approve it, you will, as Mr. Manuel has said, have ignored the will of the people. And I have a message for Shell. You may win the battle, if that's the case, but you will lose the war. Thank you. The EUB plans to make a decision within 90 days. In the meantime, George Gerlach wants to resume mediation knowing that industry cannot continue without an ongoing relationship with landowners.